Greetings, this is Jeff Riddle, pastor of Christ Reformed Baptist Church in Louisa, Virginia. And in this episode of Word Magazine, I'm going to be offering a response to a comment that was left uh, on my blog and also on my YouTube channel by Mark Ward in response to Word Magazine uh, number 240, last Word Magazine that I um, uploaded. And the title of that word magazine was, Is Confessional Bibliology KJVO? Is it right to call confessional bibliology a species or variety of King James Version onlyism? And I suggested, no, that is not correct. And I suggested that James White, and in particular Mark Ward, uh, are prone to lump confessional bibliology in under the umbrella of being um, King James Version onlyism, and they do so for rhetorical purposes because they want to dissuade people from embracing the confessional text position. So uh, today, Mark Ward left a long comment on the YouTube channel where I'd posted a uh, video version of Word Magazine 240. And he also posted the exact same comment on my blog, uh, on the blog that was related to Word Magazine 240. And he has done this before, written long comments, and a lot of times I just uh, read them. I do read them, but then I usually there's not enough time to respond because they're long and detailed. But I thought it might be worthwhile, at least for once, to take his comment and to offer kind of a point-by-point point response to it. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to read his comment. I'm going to kind of read it paragraph by paragraph. So I'll read a paragraph, and then I'll give my response to what he says. So it'll be some back and forth. hope it won't be confusing. And I plan to post uh, my notes, which will include his comments and my responses on my blog at jeffriddle.net. So if there's something you don't get in the spoken word version of it, uh, you can get it if you look at um, my blog article. So uh, here was his comment posted today. He begins, Brother Riddle, I am not, quote, against the authorized version, end quote. I love and trust the KJV. If you are asking for charitable descriptions of your position, I must ask the same. This is a persistent misrepresentation of my view. I am not against the King James Version any more than I am against the Wycliffe Bible. But if people insist on using it exclusively in churches, I must call them to the standard of 1 Corinthians 14. Edification requires intelligibility. And here is my response to the opening um, paragraph. I uh, wrote, uh, Mark Ward, my point in this podcast was to make the observation that from my perspective, it seems you often put forward inconsistencies in your rhetoric. For example, in your book, Authorize, you begin by noting that you grew up, quote, reading and hearing the KJV, end quote, adding, Quote, and I don't recall having any trouble with the verbiage, end quote, page one. But you later in the book exhort your readers on page 120 by saying, quote, children and new converts should not be given copies of the King James Version, end quote. Clearly, this latter statement is against the usage of the, of the authorized version. You say, Children and new converts should not be given copies of the King James Version. To point this out and to say that you are thus against the authorized version is not, in fact, a misrepresentation, nor is it uncharitable. It is simply what you have said before and said in print. In this podcast, I called attention, meaning uh, Word Magazine 240, I called attention to an inconsistency in your argument against confessional bibliology that was expressed in your 2020 article. In that piece, 
You initially state that, that the proponents of confessional bibliology, quote, take a different path to a similar but not identical viewpoint, end quote, as King James Version onlyism. You say that on page 57 of your article. Again, confessional bibliology takes a different path to a similar but not, not identical viewpoint. But later in the same article, you argue on pages 62 and 63 that confessional bibliology and King James Version onlyism have, quote, the same viewpoint, end quote. Your rhetoric here is inconsistent. And that was the point that was being made in the article. And a comparison was made to how in your book, Authorized, you say uh, positive things about the King James Version, like you read it as a child, but then later you say it shouldn't be given to children or to new converts. So anyway, that was the point I was making. Let's continue with his comment. This is the next paragraph. Uh, this is now in Mark Ward's voice. He writes, I sincerely wish to avoid pejorative labeling. After my book came out, when I was first contacted by William Sandel, Sandel, who was then at least a proponent of confessional bibliology, I don't know where he's at now. I believed him when he said he was not, knots in all capital letters, KJV only. Uh, here's my response. If you truly wish to avoid pejorative labeling, then do not refer to those who hold to the traditional Protestant text as being King James Version onlyist. And let me just add a side note. Um, I think I've probably corresponded with William Sandel before, but I don't know him personally, and I don't know what his views are. I'm not really sure why he felt compelled to mention him in particular at this point. Anyway, he continues. Back to Mark Ward, next paragraph. He says, But then I started talking with your followers, Dr. Riddle, and I simply could not avoid the parallels. I grew up KJV only. I know the arguments we made to one another. I note that there is massive overlap between the arguments made by IFB, that's an independent fundamental Baptist, KJV only us, and those made by confessional bibliologists. That's the end of his paragraph. And here's my response to that. Uh, first, I'm not sure who these followers of mine are or whether they accurately reflected my position. I can only speak for myself. Second, definitions are again a problem in your viewpoint, in your argument. Did you grow up in a church of the Ruckman, Ripplinger, King James Version only variety? Or in a church that simply preferred the King James Version? Whatever the case, your experience does not necessarily mean that you properly understand the confessional text position. You claim there are, quote, massive overlaps, end quote, with your still undefined um, understanding of King James Version onlyism and confessional bibliology. Are there not also massive differences between these two camps? And then I say, let's look at your list, because he next provides a list of these supposed massive overlaps. And the list is pretty long. We'll go through them one by one, hopefully. Um, so this is now back to Mark Quartz's comment. And he has this list of these massive, supposed massive overlaps between undefined King James Version onlyism and confessional bibliology. He writes, both groups use the same proof texts. And he puts in parentheses Matthew 518, Psalm 12, 6 and 7, Psalm 119, 105, Matthew 4, 4, etc. My response to, to that that I wrote is this. Wouldn't nearly all Christians make use of these passages and other similar ones in building their bibliology? I mean, is it only people who are supposedly the, in this undefined King James Version only group and confessional bibliologists who make use of these passages? Wouldn't like mainstream evangelicals, they would have a different interpretation of the passages, but wouldn't they appeal to some of them with respect to their bibliology? 
Um, even if they don't think Psalm 12, 6 and 7 has to do with preservation, they would think it would have to do with their understanding the purity of God's word, for example. So why do you say that there is, is this massive overlap? I think this, these passages are, are used generally in Christendom with respect to uh, the doctrine of Scripture. Uh, his next point, uh, this so supposed massive overlap, he writes, both groups use the same key words to describe the TR slash KJV. Words like preserved, pure, stable, settled, unchanging. My response to this is brief. I wrote, wouldn't, again, most ordinary Christians use these words to describe the Bible? Even those who have no firm views or understanding on text or translation. Uh, are these words only used by, in this undefined uh, KJV only group and confessional bibliologists? Wouldn't terms like preserved, pure, stable, settled, unchanging? I mean, again, pure is simply a biblical word from Psalm 12:6. Um, wouldn't all Christians generally use these words? Um, so I'm challenging whether there's this supposed overlap he's argued for. Um, next, uh, he writes, both groups insist that inspiration demands perfect preservation. Um, my response, but uh, according to your own viewpoint, according to your own definitions, undefined, True King James Version only is of the Ruckman Ripplinger variety would say that preservation applies to an English inspiration and preservation apply to an English translation and not to the immediately inspired divine originals of Hebrew and Greek, as stated in the Westminster Confession of Faith, chapter one and paragraph eight. So your statement here about the connection between inspiration and preservation is not true of what is held by Ruckman Rip, uh, Ripplinger, KJV only, and confessional bibliologists. There's a massive difference uh, in that um, those who hold a confessional bibliology are not looking to any vernacular translation, but they talk about the immediately inspired Hebrew and Greek. Next point, uh, Mark Ward writes, both groups use the same tone. He says, this is admittedly a more subjective judgment than the previous two points. And frankly, you are a more courteous combatant, Dr. Riddle. I don't expect this comment to be persuasive to you, but for the cause of truth, I must say it. All right. So he says another massive uh, similarity between KJV only and confessional bibliology folk is we have the same tone, apparently a harsh tone. Um, so here's my response. I said, uh, referring to his, his statement, this is admittedly a more subjective judgment. I said, you're right. This is a completely subjective judgment. By the way, I've also received some pretty harsh comments from modern texts only. I had someone recently uh, who is an advocate for the modern critical text who messaged me and said that I'm a false teacher. Um, does that mean he's a KJV onlyist because he used a harsh tone? <laughs> um, so uh, it's, it's I don't know, it's kind of silly to say that um, using a harsh tone is exclusive to any one group. I think all the groups do that. Anyways, his next point, he says, both groups maximize the differences between the TR and the critical text. You yourself, in your review of my book, called the critical text, quote, a completely different underlying text. My response back to that was, do you deny that there are fundamental differences between the traditional text and the modern critical text? If you deny that there are fundamental differences between them, then why don't you just embrace the traditional text if they're not that different? Of course, we all believe that the text is different. You wouldn't hold to the modern critical text if you didn't think it was different from the traditional text. And clearly, I believe the traditional text uh, is different than the modern critical text. Look at the textual key printed by the, the Trinitarian Bible Society in the New Testament. It lists, what, 650 differences, and that's just scratching the surface. There are thousands more. So clearly, uh, we're talking about two different texts. Um, he continues, 
Both groups call the critical text corrupt and argue that it undermines or attacks Christian doctrines. Critical text proponents do not return this favor. I believe Scribner's TR is a good reconstruction of the original text, not just the best available. So here's my response to that. Again, he's saying that one of the reasons that he's justified in giving um, those in the confessional text camp the label of being King James Version only is, is that we share somehow exclusively with this undefined KJV only group an idea that the modern critical text is corrupt and it affects Christian doctrines. So here's my response. Is not the integrity of the text of the Bible a key doctrinal issue? Does it not affect other issues like canon, preservation, authority, etc.? To remove Mark 16, 9 through 20 or John 7, 53 through 8, 11 would remove 24 verses from the Bible. 12 from the ending of Mark, 12 from John 7, 53 through 8, 11. This would be the equivalent to one or more shorter books of the New Testament. To remove 1 John uh, 5, 7b through 8a, the Coma Ioanneum, would deprive the church of a key proof text for the Trinity. Um, modern translations and texts of John 1.18 challenge the doctrine of the eternal generation of the Son. These and other examples clearly show that the doctrinal stakes are high when it comes to the text of the Bible. By the way, modern critical text advocates claim that the traditional text is corrupted. He, he said in his note that whereas uh, that we call uh, the, the, the changes made in the modern critical text corruptions, he said that's something that critical text proponents never do. Well, did he listen to my debate with James White when James White said that Mark 16, 9 through 20 was an unorthodox, spurious, unorthodox corruption of the text of the Bible. And I recently listened to an OPC pastor preaching on the Pericope Adulteri, and he suggested it was a spurious edition, and, and that so it was a corruption in the New Testament that should not be preached or taught upon. So um, we believe it's a corruption to take out the Pericope Adulteri, but there are people who advocate for the critical text who believe that the Pericope Adulteri is a corruption and should be removed from the text as the Tyndall, Greek New, uh, New Testament, Tyndall House Greek New Testament has done. Let's move, go on. His next point, back to Mark Ward's voice. He says, both groups refuse to answer the which TR question. They consistently claim to have a perfectly pure text, but just as consistently dodge the questions of which TR is perfect and why. And I'll, I'll lump in another point here. He says, both groups functionally, as you said to Dwayne Green, practically resort to Scrivener's TR. And that TR is the KJV. Um, here's my answer to his points uh, here. Um, answers to the which TR question I wrote have been given by the Trinitarian Bible Society in its statement on the doctrine of Holy Scripture, by myself on my blog, by Robert Trulove, by Vince Krivda, by R.L. Vaughn, who called the which TR question a stratagem of debate, and more recently in a short video by Christian McShaffrey, who citing Bergen called it a diversion fallacy, throwing dust into the eyes. Scribner's TR is clearly the Protestant standard in use today. And by the way, I would challenge his statement that the TR is the KJV. Um, I'll do a video on this at some point talking about how uh, Scribner's uh, TR is not simply um, a supposed back uh, translation into Greek from the KJV. That's an absurd statement. And it, it probably is underlying um, um, word statement here. Um, oh, okay, back to my uh, comments. I said, is it that no one has answered your question or that you don't like the answers? Again, definition is important. 
A KJV onlyist, by strict definition, would not embrace Scribner's TR, since it is not the King James Version. You can't say we're King James Version onlyists <laughs> because we embrace Scribner's TR. A King James Version onlyist, by definition, would only affirm the King James Version. He wouldn't look to a Greek edition of the New Testament like Scribner's edition or any other one. Anyone who suggests the TR is the standard is not a King James Version onlyist by definition. Next, Mark Ward writes, both group groups put, quote, the TR, end quote, in their church and other institutional doctrinal statements, but fail to specify which TR they believe to be perfect. Here's my response. Again, definitions are key. If an, a church or an institution is truly King James Version only ist, then it certainly would not list the TR as a standard, but it would only list the King James Version. Churches and institutions are free to define the translations and texts that they choose to use. Is it really confusing if a church or institution says that they use the traditional text without specifying a certain edition? Doesn't at least tell you they're not using the modern critical text? And then my other question uh, to Mark Ward is this. Do you apply this same standard to churches and institutions that embrace the modern critical text and modern translations? So do you insist that if a church uses the ESV, that they must specify in their constitution or somewhere on their website which edition of the Nestle-Lalland uh, Novum Testamentum Graeche that they make use of? which edition of the Biblia Hebraica they make use of. And then I would, ask, I would ask Mark Ward, Mark, does your church do this? Does it say we use the NA28 or we use the NA26 or, or whatever? So if you're going to apply that standard to conservative churches that use the traditional text, are you also going to apply this to evangelical churches that have embraced the modern critical text? Uh, next point, he writes, both groups refuse to explain the specific differences between TR editions that I talked about in my paper. Two years on, I still simply do not know how you would handle those specifics. I listed 10 passages in which the two TRs I looked at exhibit, quote, differences in words that produce differences in meaning, end quote. I listed one missing clause, 1 John 2.23, and two outright contradictions, James 2.18, and Revelation 11.2 between TR editions. I do not know how you account for these because you have not explained. All right, so here is what I wrote in response to that. I wrote, uh, Mark, have you ever considered that there might be problems in some of the premises in your paper? Like, for example, you offer comparisons between one printed edition, the 1550 Stephanus, and Scrivener's. Why should the minor differences between these two editions hold weight when it has already been affirmed that Scribner's is the generally accepted standard in our day? Also, have confessional bibliology, bibliology advocates really refused to respond to your objections? I would ask you, are we obligated to respond to the objections of any and everyone who disagree with us? Or do only your papers, your podcasts, your articles hold this special power? Why are we obligated to respond to you to justify our beliefs? We might choose to, but you seem to be upset. And you seem to have this idea that we're somehow we're obligated and we're in the wrong because we have refused to do that. We haven't refused. Maybe we just didn't have time yet. Or maybe we didn't feel like it would be worthwhile because it wouldn't be well received. I don't know. Or even listened to. Um, his next point, both groups dismiss and ignore my false friends argument. They say, ironically, that people should study to show themselves approved. To my knowledge, not a single KJV defender in either group has publicly or privately acknowledged learning a specific false friend from me. And very, very few, Robert Trulove being a very notable exception, Brian Ross, being another, have acknowledged that there are any false friends in the KJV English at all, even though their own TBS Westminster Reference Bible and defined King James Bible list numbers of my false friends. 
Here's my response. Again, Mark, are we required to respond to your arguments? I did address one of your suggested false friends, the use of the term halt in my review of your book, and I challenged the idea that this term is confusing or incomprehensible for modern readers. Next, he writes, you said confessional Christians necessarily reject KJV onlyism, especially of the Ruckman Ripplinger variety. I don't deny this. But this defines KJV onlyism narrowly as Ruckmanite double inspiration. My IFB church growing up was not Ruckmanite, but we were KJV only and proud of it. And we said almost all the same things you say about the King James Version, minus anything about the Westminster Confession, of course, exclamation mark. Here's my response. Again, definition is a big problem for your position. It's a big problem for the article you wrote in 2020. It is you who lumped in those who prefer the King James Version with those who hold to Ruckman Ripplinger views. I'm not yet convinced you understand why a confessional man cannot be called K KJVO. Westminster Confession 1.8 is key. It is the immediate inspiration of the original Hebrew and Greek that is central, not translations. I said this in the podcast, whether that's the Latin Vulgate of the medieval period, whether that's the King James Version of uh, the modern period. Um, his next point, Mark Ward's voice again, he writes, You said there are those who affirm the confessional text position who do not make primary or exclusive use of the King James Version. I acknowledge this. After years of searching, I know two such people. And both of them go to the same church. And one of them has said to me that he is privately frustrated with the rest of the confessional bibliology for being basically KJV only. That's a very interesting comment. Um, here's my response. I said, Mark, your anecdotal experiences are not the standard. There are, in fact, more than just two examples of persons who embrace the traditional text, but who do, do not make exclusive use of the King James Version, and they're not all in the same church. You also have not yet addressed the issue I raised in my podcast. That is, the Trinitarian Bible Society is doing translations of the Bible into other languages based on the traditional Reformation Protestant text. What about my German friend, Andre, whose comment I read on Word Magazine uh, 240? What about my friends in the Swedish Reformation Bible Society? Are they King James Version only? You haven't really responded to that, Mark. Um, isn't that a, a major defeater for your idea that confessional bibliology is KJV only, if the word only means anything in KJVO? Um, let's see. Oh, we're down to the next, to the last uh, paragraph. Uh, Mark Ward writes, Dr. Riddle, the best way to get me to stop using the label KJV onlyism for your view is to provide an answer to the substance of my argument in that Detroit paper. How do you handle the differences among classic mature Protestant editions of the TR if they exhibit the same kinds of variants as do the TR and the critical text? Why are those variants corruptions for my text but not for yours? I responded, Mark, whether or not I respond to your article, I have the feeling you will still try to lump in confessional bibliology as King James Version onlyism. Smiles. I've already addressed this issue in my 2019 blog, blog article responding to Dirk Youngkind. I may get around to responding to your 2020 article at some point. To be straight, I see some major logical problems with your argument, which makes responding a challenge. One of those logical problems is the emphasis you give at the end of your article to the supposed significance of differences in printed editions of the TR and differences between the TR and the modern critical text. To me, this comparison seems illogical. Perhaps I ha I'll have time to explain why at some point in the future. Um, last uh, 
paragraph here in Mark's comment. He writes, You are a gifted man. I have heard from a reliable source that you are an excellent preacher. Thanks. <laughs> I don't like having this disagreement with you. I am frustrated, brother, that you will not answer what I take to be simple questions that before the Lord I asked in good faith. Uh, my response, Mark, you're right that this is not a personal disagreement. I really don't know you personally. Never met you. Uh, this is an intellectual and a theological disagreement. I'm sorry you feel frustrated. If it is any consolation, you can be sure that many in the confessional text camp find your perspective on these matters, and especially your insistence on labeling our position as KJVO, to be frustrating as well. With respect to this podcast, Word Magazine 240, your comments here do not really answer the three main objections that were put forward in this episode to your claim that the confessional text is the same as King James Version onlyism. Namely, you didn't respond uh, first to, to my challenge, which was, uh, I asked you, can you define what KJVO is? And then, will you address the fact that the, you use the term too broadly? And my suspicion is that you do so in your writing and in your podcast and your speaking for rhetorical purposes, because you know that People will have a negative association with the idea of King James Version onlyism. So if you call our position that, then uh, you hope to win people over to a negative assessment of our position. Secondly, you do not explain how a confessional bibliology advocate could hold to the Westminster Confession of Faith, chapter 1, paragraph 8, and its insistence on the immediate inspiration of the Bible only in the original Hebrew and Greek and still be reasonably and fairly described as King James Version onlyist. Third, you do not explain how one could hold to confessional bibliology but not make exclusive use of the King James Version and even be someone who does not speak English as a first language or even English at all, but who prefers the traditional Hebrew and Greek texts of the Protestant Reformation and translations made from those texts in their own language. And still, how could that person still be reasonably and fairly described as King James Version only? And then I close out my response by just saying, regards, JTR, Jeffrey Todd Riddle. Um, well, this is going to bring this episode of Word Magazine to a conclusion. Again, my responses to Mark Ward's comments that were posted to the last episode of Word Magazine, Word Magazine 240. And I again, I will post um, a written version of this uh, to my blog at jeffriddle.net. I hope this has been helpful, uh, encouraging and edifying for those who are listening. And I'll look forward to speaking to you in the next Word Magazine. Till then, take care and God bless.